have your Bibles, amen, I want you to lift your Bibles up. I want you to lift them up high. I want you to repeat out to me, uh, this is my Bible, my weapon for spiritual warfare is sharper than a two-edged sword, and I'm not afraid to use it, to use it, amen, amen, amen. I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter number one, Ephesians chapter number one, and I want to begin reading at verse number 15. Ephesians chapter number one. I'm going to start at verse number 15. When you have it, so praise the Lord. Hmm. Ephesians chapter one. Beginning at verse number 15. And it reads. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding, exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the work of his mighty Power. Amen. I, I want to preach to you. If you only knew. My subject today is if you only knew. If you only knew. Hmm. I got to get a swig of water because this is going to be a hot one. Hmm. The difference between identity theft and identity crisis <laughs> is identity theft is when somebody steals your identity. Steals your essential self. Steals your name. Steals your personal information of who you are. Identity crisis, however, is different from identity theft. <laughs> identity crisis is not knowing who you really are. It is a sense of feeling uncertain about yourself or uncertain to who you are. Now, hypothetically speaking, if I had a choice to have my identity stolen or to have an identity crisis, I'd rather have my identity stolen than to live in this world not knowing who I am. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> because if my identity was stolen, I can recover that. I can recover my essential self. I can recover my name. I can recover my personal information. But on the other hand, if I don't know who I am, then I don't know what I've been missing. Yeah. Oh, my God, my God, I'm a, my God, my God. So in that case, I'd rather have my identity stolen as the, than, than having an identity crisis because it's important to know who I am and who I serve. Because knowing who I am entitles me to what is rightfully mine. <laughs> 
When I know who I am, I have an entitlement to what is rightfully mine. It, in Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, he realized that the church was suffering from an identity crisis. And the danger of suffering from an identity crisis is that it robs you of what is rightfully yours. It robs you of what is rightfully yours. If you don't know who you are, then you won't know what you've been missing. Listen to me. Ephesians was written to a church who was spiritually rich beyond measure. And yet they were living beneath their privileges and blessings of God. In other words, Paul went from praising God for their salvation to praying to God to give them uh, uh, unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because I need you to understand something right now. It's not only important to be saved, but it is also important to have wisdom and revelation. You are, uh, ain't enough, baby. You can't stop at the street of salvation, but you got to go a little bit further. It's not important for you just to get saved, but it's just important that you get wisdom and revelation because wisdom is, is what gives you the insight into the true nature of the things of God. And revelation, which is the unveiling of the object of who God is. He said, look, I'm, I went from praising God for your salvation, but I'm going and moving to praying that the Lord will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul says, I, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He realizes, he said, I'm praying for the church that it will receive the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation because the true purpose of having or receiving this wisdom and revelation is for the purpose of knowing God better. In other words, knowing him in an intimate and personal way, developing an intimate awareness of God, character, and desires. Paul said, I am praying that you will receive spiritual insight and factual knowledge because you need to know the truth and the facts about God. See, it's one thing for you to get saved, but baby, you need to learn the truth and the facts about the God that you serve. Listen, when you receive spiritual insight and factual knowledge about God, it will increase your percentage rate of being successful. Yes. Woo. When you receive spiritual insight, and factual knowledge about God, it will increase your percentage rate of being successful because of the relationship you have with God. We must understand, we need to understand something, that victory comes from the spiritual realm into the natural realm. So victory starts in the spiritual realm before it occurs in the natural realm. Oh my God. David, let me tell you something. David had already won the battle over Goliath before he even set a foot on the battlefield. <laughs> he had already won. Before he even got on the battlefield, he was the victor before he even threw over the first rock. He was the victor because he had won in the spiritual realm and it manifested in the natural realm. And this is why, this is why most church ain't, most people in the church ain't getting because it ain't manifested in the spiritual. And if it don't manifest in the spiritual, baby, it ain't going to show up in the natural. David had already won the battle with Goliath before, before he ever set a foot on the battlefield. David didn't, in other words, David didn't have a superficial knowledge of God. I need you to understand something. But David had a spiritual insight and a factual knowledge of who God was. David had a personal and intimate relationship with God. And God gave him the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Listen, when you have a personal relationship 
and an intimate relationship with God. He will in turn give you a spirit of wisdom and he will give you a spirit of revelation and, and, and the knowledge of him. In other words, God told him who he was and what he was. Oh my God, in other words, David, in other words, here what you got to must understand something, that David was not suffering from an identity crisis. He wasn't suffering from an identity crisis. He knew that he was one of God's anointed. Yes. He knew that he was the head and not the tail. He knew that he was above and not beneath. He knew that he was more than a conqueror. And it re not only did he know this, but it reflected in his life and his speech. Yes. Yes. It, it, it reflected in his life and his speech. And he, in other words, he walked and talked like he had spiritual insight and factual knowledge about God. So I'm going to tell you something. When you have this relationship with God and, and you have this intimate relationship with God and he blesses you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and you have this spiritual insight and this factual knowledge of, of who God is, it will cause you to walk different. It will cause you to talk different because you have this insight. You've got this unveiling, this revelation of who God is. That's why he stuck out like a sore thumb when he walked on the battlefield. When everybody was crying, boo-hooing, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares to defile the army of the living God? Because he had a spiritual insight and factual knowledge of who God was. And God revealed to him the knowledge of him. He got the facts about God. He knew the truth about God. And he woke like he knew. He talked like he knew. And he already knew that I already defeated this giant before I stepped on the battlefield. Because I already defeated him in the spiritual realm. You can't defeat something you don't see. In other words, you got to see it in the spiritual realm. You, David already saw himself victorious. Before he went out there to fight Goliath. And this is what the people of God are missing. They don't see themselves coming out. They don't see themselves as the victors. They see themselves as the victims. And you shouldn't see your way, yourself that way. You see, you got to see yourself victory. You got to see yourself treading over the snakes and the scorpions. It was all in his walk. It was all in his talk. Because 1 Samuel 17 Shows us this. First, 7, 17, verse 45 says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read it. You ain't got to go there. You can get the CD or you can turn there. But First Samuel 17, verse 45 said, so I'm going to show you how David, because he had the insight who God was and had the factual knowledge of who God was, how it changed the way he walked and he talked. <laughs> and when you have this insight of God and you have this factual knowledge that he is able to supply my every need according to his riches and his glory, when he uh, uh, have put a fence around me and he is my, my line of defense, when you have that type, oh my God, it causes you to walk different and talk different. First Samuel 17 and 45 said, 1 Samuel 17 and 45, it said, Then David said unto the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day, he's, he, 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 boy, he's, he got some swag on him. He's talking some good stuff. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hand, and I will smite you and take thy, your head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the fields of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God and Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord and he will give you into our hands. 
In other words, when I went in there, when I when he went on the battlefield, he already had the spiritual insight. He had the factual knowledge that look, I got a personal relationship with God, and I know when I go and do this, God is gonna back me, and the whole the whole company of heaven is behind me. So David knew firsthand. Listen, check this out. David knew firsthand the exceedingly greatness of his power towards us were to who believe according to the working of his mighty power. <laughs> he knew because God gave him this insight and this factual knowledge. See, let me tell you something. When you believe God with your whole life, I ain't talking about with part of your life. When you did, when you believe God with the whole totality of who you are. When you did, when you when you believe God for for everything, God will direct His power towards you. Yes. Listen to me now. He will direct His power to you, and He will begin to, and you will begin to experience His unlimited greatness of power at work on the inside of you. Yes. David believed God with his whole life. Not, not, not with a partial of his being, but he believed God with his whole life. And this is the, this is the benefit of all of the true believers. I ain't saying just any believer. All of the true believers. He, he, when you have, you will, you will begin to experience his unlimited greatness of power at work on, on the inside of you. And this is what Paul didn't want the church to miss out on. Church, Paul said, I don't want this church to miss out on the power of God. Because this power of God is designed to help us to succeed in him and in his world. God said, I'm get, I directed this power to you so you would have success in me. And not only in success in me, but in success in his world. And God has made his power available to all the true believers. He makes his power available to all the true believers. But God, but, but here's the thing, but you got to know who you are in order to operate in it. Listen to me. The power of God is available to every true believer, but you got to know who you are in order to operate in it. Listen. A vast majority of the church is suffering from an identity crisis. They don't know who they are, therefore they don't know the benefits they have. They don't know who they are, they don't know the benefits that they have. Because if they did, you would see it in their walk and you would see it in their talk. Paul, and, and, and Paul made mention of this. Paul said, I'm making mention of this. I, and, and the reason why I'm saying, Paul said, in other words, Paul says it in Ephesians 4 and 1. See, we must understand this. Your conduct must match your calling. I'm going to say this again. Your conduct must match your calling. In other words, if you say that you, if you say that God have called you unto this new life, listen to me now, then your conduct is what produces the evidence to prove it. In other words, your, your conduct produces the evidence that you've been really called by God. The way you walk, the way you talk proves that God have called you to new life. And that's why he said in Ephesians 4 and 1, and Paul said, I therefore beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. What he's saying here is I'm encouraging you to live the kind of life which proves that God have called you. In other words, he said, no, don't let it only be in your speech, but it got to be in your conduct. If God indeed have called you, then you should have the conduct to prove that God have called you in the midst of this uh, wicked and perverse world. And the Bible said, see, I'm going to tell you something. When David got anointed by God, he was totally different from that day that God anointed him. Amen. In other words, 
His conduct proved that he was called of God. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to 1 Samuel 16, verse number 13. 1 Samuel 16 and 13. 1 Samuel 16, 13. This is where when... Samuel goes to Jesse's house and he anoints David. I want to show you something in this first Samuel chapter 16, verse number 13. Because now he is anointing him before all of his, ham his family. The ones that thought that they were going to be the king. The one that thought that the anointing was going to rest on them. The one that had great statues. The one who thought they had going had it going on. God said, I, I, I want to chew it out. I don't, I don't want name one of them. I, 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 want, I want this little bitty Rudy boy. This ruddy boy. I, I want David, the one that was looked over, the one that his daddy left out at in the pasture. I want, I want David. Bring David. He says in verse number 16 and 13, Then Samuel took the horn, horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And look what he said. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. From that day forward. Listen, from that day forward, David began to walk in his anointing. David began to talk in that anointing, he knew who he was, and he knew what he was, and he received spiritual insight and factual knowledge about God, which caused him to be victorious. And this is what's going on within the church, and Paul was dealing with this church in Ephesus, that this church didn't know who he was, they was, and what they was. And Paul said, I'm praying that your eyes will be open and that you would understand the benefits that you have of being a true believer in God. These benefits that you have, the benefits you have of treading over snakes and scorpions, the benefits that you have to the heavenly realms because of what Jesus did upon the cross. Now, he said, now what you got to understand now, now that you've been saved, now that you have come into this understanding, why you are not walking in the anointing that God has placed upon you, why you are not talking like the anointing that was placed upon you, standing all over this building. If you only knew. Some of you, you're under the sound of my voice, and you don't even know who you are. You don't even know what you are. And you don't even know the benefits that you have as believers, as true believers of the Most High God. Here's a church that is filled with all type, is rich in all type of spiritual blessing, but they don't know who they are. And they was getting robbed from what was rightfully theirs. Listen, I'm, right now. So the matter is, it's not an, an identity theft. But there is an identity crisis that's going on in the church. And if you only knew who you are and who you serve. So I'm going to tell you something. What a lot of people in the church are lacking, they're lacking the spirit of wisdom and they're lacking the revelation of who God really is. 
And when you lack the insight, and when you lack the factual knowledge, it disqualifies you from the power. That's why you got to know who you are in God. So he would give you the power that you need to help you. It's nowhere in the world, it's nowhere in the world you can have the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. And your percentage rate of succeeding goes down. If you got the spirit of wisdom and revelation, your percentage rate of succeeding should go up. Everything that you touch turns to gold. It's supposed to prosper. Because you got spiritual insight and factual knowledge which qualifies you for the power. And as I was studying this, God began to show me this is why Jesus took the disciples off to Caesarea Philippi. When he took them to Caesarea Philippi, he said, he took the disciples and he asked them, he said, now, I need to ask y'all guys a question, all 12 of you. Who do the people say that I am? Some say a prophet of old. Some say that you Jeremiah. Some say Elijah. He said, no, no, no. Now that you've been walking with me, now that you have been intimate with me, I'm going to ask you this question. Who do you say I am? Because what I need you to know, I need to, you to know that you got spiritual insight and you got factual knowledge of who I am. But see, we had a, a spokesman in the bunch named Peter. said, I know who you are. I saw you walking on the water. I seen you heal the blind eyes. He said, you are the son of God. And you know what he said? Very good. Now you are ready for the power. And I'm going to give you this power. And guess what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Because the power comes when you get spiritual insight. Listen to me. And factual knowledge of who he is. And that's why people are not seeing the manifestation. You got to, you got to get the insight. You got to get the factual knowledge. You got to get the truth about God. You got to get the facts about God. In order for you to go into this thing. And come out of this thing like victorious. I was telling a man. When we was at work. and I say. Uh, Michael I heard that you. You've been sick. This is a deacon of the church. And I said wow. People wrapped up in religion, they don't, they, they don't have a real relationship with God. And as he said, yeah, preacher, I've been sick. I got this incurable disease. I got diabetes. And I said, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, wait a minute. Hold on. I said, don't you know we serve a God? Hey, there's no disease under heaven that Jesus cannot heal. But church folks are speaking this defeat over their life. They don't know who they are. Because when you have a personal relationship with God and an intimacy with God, guess what? You learn the facts. And the fact says, with his stripes I am healed. The truth says that this don't have to be a death sentence. The word of God said, who report shall we believe? That's something when we have... People in the church not having spiritual insight and factual knowledge of who God is. And, you, and when you don't know this, it robs you of what is rightfully yours. And I'm going to tell you something, and it ain't the devil neither that's causing you to, to miss on this identity Christ. Because what he'll do, he more so in the identity theft, but he ain't into the identity crisis. It's because we won't. We won't read. We won't study. We won't. We can't blame everything on the enemy. Because what's, now that you are saved, now that you are born again, 
Now that you are filled with the Holy Ghost, it's time to move out into the deep. See, I'm going to tell you what the church got to cut out. The church got to cut out giving God the bare minimum. Because the bare minimum is not going to get you nowhere in God. But the Bible, my Bible reads that you got to press towards the mark of the high calling. You can't make it in the bare minimum. You got to get up and you got to move in God. You got to, my God. Listen, if there anybody that's under the sound of my voice. And you can be perfectly honest. That God just blowed your cover. And you've been wrestling with this identity crisis. You've been unsure. Of who you are. Unsure. Of what you're supposed to be. Come down to this altar right now.